cutting into our last hour, and we have a full boat of calls. Good luck getting through now. That's why I think we went to the calls early. I just I had a feeling. So we're getting in as many as we can for Glenn Kimball of Kimball College. It's his new course, uh, and the new course is all about Bigfoot and these ancient manuscripts which indicate ape-like creatures. But, you know, th- th- this is probably a subject that comes up in a couple of Cl- Glenn Kimball courses you can find out more online by linking up to him through coasttocoastam.com. If you missed the blog earlier, I'll just mention that crypto news for this evening from the first hour is up too, and you can link up to that through coasttocoastam.com. And and we'll get to your questions and comments about Bigfoot-like creatures uh, being referenced in ancient manuscripts. We read some of them earlier, uh, and these uh, these references clearly or seem to clearly indicate that there were intelligent she-ape type queens, uh, some that, that, that were working out of caves. Uh, and, uh, and then Glenn's theory that, that the reason why we haven't found any Bigfoot bones is because the funereal practices of the Bigfoot preclude us just kind of find them lying around. We would have to know in what cave, and we would know we'd have to know like which twist and turn in these elaborate cave systems would lead us to the Bigfoot cemetery. But we'll continue with your questions on this too next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Going to our last hour with Glenn Kimball. Let's start with a very patient man named Drew in Oakland on Coast to Coast AM. Drew. Well, thanks for the compliment, and it's good to hear you guys talking about this stuff. This is kind of a wild card call, but it does relate to an ancient manuscript of sorts. In fact, it's a bit of sacred geometry that I came up with a couple of years back, and I've been sitting on it for a while waiting for an opportunity to share this. It relates to the book of Revelations. Why are there four horsemen? Why are the horses is the question, and I was uh, looking at the chessboard and seeing the four horses on the chessboard, and I found an interesting uh, set of line drawings that are a description. I could only say a hyperdimensional genetic time code of some kind. I don't know. It's over my head, but that's why I want to share it, because someone out there has a piece of this puzzle. But this is a very big deal. And, and uh, uh, just... Tell me, I mean, what's significant about them being symmetrical game pieces on a chessboard? Let's put it this way. Uh, the, the symbol in Revelations was it's, is, is just a clue to look into the game. If you put the four horses in the center of the board and then surround the remaining 28 pieces around those four pieces, the spaces that the knights can reach from the four spaces in the center of the board exactly corresponds to the remaining number of pieces in the game, and it makes a cross in the shape of the world tree, which, is, as we know, is the ener- energetic gen- uh, pattern of energy uh, well, it circumscribes the earth, I guess you might say. There's a lot of ways to describe it. All right. Well, Glenn, uh, you have a thought on that? Uh, no, uh, that's news to me. Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt that the symbol of the towel would be uh, a generic symbol. We did a, a class a couple of months ago on the swastika, uh, which was a holy symbol um, adopted by the by Germany and Hitler. Stolen. Uh, in hopes to be able to bless his efforts. Uh, but uh, the swastika facing one direction and the swastika facing the other direction with the arms facing the exact opposite direction was an implication of, of from of from what direction came uh, the survivors from the, the cataclysmic events that happened prior to that time. Uh, one of them came from, from the Far East, which were the people of Mo. And the people from the with the swastika facing, uh, with the arms facing the other direction, were the people from Atlantis who came from the destruction from the opposite direction, um, mm. and mm. that's uh, part of the reason why there was an upper and a lower Egypt. Uh, the upper Egypt uh, had its swastika or its good luck symbol facing one direction, and the people in lower Egypt had its swastika facing the other direction. And, and these two different civilizations believed that they had the remnants of a civilization that was destroyed uh, in two different directions at the same time. They eventually merged. But uh, the, the swastika has enormous implications. It's still in use today um, in, in every culture in the world, with the exception of those 
who were severely affected by the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, Bob is in Chicago on Coast to Coast AM. Bob, you're talking with Glenn Kimball. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Glenn, listen, could you clear something up for me? This Patterson tape where uh, they uh, tape Bigfoot down by the creek and he turns and looks at the, the person uh, supposedly uh, Mr. Patterson was, uh, he, he turns and looks at Mr. Mr. Patterson. Well, Mr. Meldrum, Jeff Meldrum, he says that is that is a good tape. He believes that to be Bigfoot. But they interviewed the woman who said that she was in that costume. And she said she told her husband she was not going to get into that costume anymore because she felt that or she thought someone was going to, might shoot her. And the Wallace tape really wasn't a tape. The Wallace tape, or, uh, excuse me, not the tape, but they, Wallace, wasn't he the guy who had the footprints? And as far uh, as I understand, from what I understand, there was only one tape. So what's the story? If Mr. M- uh, Meldrum believes that's a good, uh, that is Bigfoot, so does Mr. Moneymaker. Do you believe, Glenn, that is Bigfoot on that tape? Uh, I, I truly believe that it was Bigfoot on that tape. Uh, I, I, I believe that it, you, you're going to have to ask Jeff to have his own opinion. Uh, he's he's the anthropologist and geneticist that analyzed the movements of the body on the tape, and I'm not the one that should be doing that. Jeff should be doing that for himself. But uh, in terms of this guy that uh, straps some wooden uh, feet print on his feet and and uh, uh, traipsed up and down uh, the uh, timber trails in Northern California, uh, I, I can't tell you how many people have try to uh, to cheat uh, uh, the premier listeners okay, well, <laughs> with regard to Bigfoot. Right, but what about the woman who says she was in the Patterson tape and she was in that costume? They interviewed her on the news. I saw the uh, right. The, well, just so you know, there there have been several people who claim to have been involved in it or have. Uh, um, I don't know if they. I don't know if either. I don't know if everybody claimed to be inside the suit, but they claimed to have inside knowledge about it anyway. And and as far as I know, both guys, Patterson and, and Gimlin, have always dismissed allegations that they hoaxed the footage by filming anybody and wearing not an ape suit. room inside that uh, ape costume to fit everybody in. Someone's lying, and yeah. if, if one lie, maybe all are lying. Okay, thank you. Now, you know what? I think you bring up a really good point, though, and I agree in that sense that I've always had my suspicions about that. And it's only because um, Jeff Meldrum, whom I respect a lot, seemed, went way out of his way to uh, to analyze the gait, the muscle movement, uh, you know, all of the various measurements of the body uh, that I, I had to kind of open back up again to the possibility that maybe maybe it's real after all. Anyway, Ron is in uh, Ole. Is it Olean or Olean, New York? Ron? It's called Olean. You pronounce Olean. Olean. Yeah. There you go. You're talking with uh, Glenn Kimball. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just have a question about if there's anything on record of Bigfoot's not being the standard size, because I saw something which I thought was a Bigfoot, but it, it was only about five foot, maybe two or so. Well, there, there are infants. Uh, these, these have... Uh, uh, children just like anybody else does, and uh, some of the, uh, you know, I've never seen a big foot myself, with one exception, and that is that I have a very, very good friend that I've known for years, that uh, he and I have, I, I would trust him implicitly to tell me the truth. Uh, he came face to face with the big fit within 10 feet of him, and he said, Glenn, I'm sorry, I've seen one, it's real. And if you talk to Jeff, uh, he says there's no doubt in his mind that the phenomena does exist. Uh, so, you know, it, it, to some extent, uh, science would love to have you bring the, the body of a Bigfoot into their laboratory so that they could have something to write a paper about and that would come from their office. Uh, how many – we only have 1% or less than 1% of history and of our science that could ever fit inside of a laboratory to begin with. Uh, We have theories about big holes and event horizons and and things that would never uh, have uh, the opportunity to be demonstrated on the surface of the earth. Uh, It's not possible. And so those who require uh, uh, this kind of phenomenon to be uh, 
presented in their laboratory, I think, are kidding themselves and have violated their own scientific principles. Uh, science was never intended to be the Carl Sagan approach that says to make extraordinary claims, you have to have extraordinary proof. There's not one single theorem in mathematics or in philosophy or in anything else other than in Carl Sagan that, has, that requires a discovery to have extraordinary proof before it can be real. My dad told me when I was eight years old, he said, if you want to start a new business, and my family, I come from a very entrepreneurial background, uh, my family does. He says, if you were to ask ten people whether or not you should start a business, he says, all ten would tell you no. He says, not nine out of ten. He said, all ten would tell you no. And <laughs> and that has a great application here in the, in the sense that if you were to ask people, does Bigfoot exist, if you were to ask someone from Harvard, all of those who are skeptics, and, and Hesiod spoke of this, that our, our, epic, our day would be characterized by its own skepticism, and it would be the limit, it, it, would be, it would limit our ability to reverse engineer the things that needed to be done to save our own, to save our own hide and to save us from the cataclysm. Uh, not, we wouldn't... We have no place to begin because no one can agree. There isn't a scientific expert in the world that agree, agrees with this colleague across the hallway. None of them. I can guarantee you Jeff and I don't agree. Um, <laughs> uh, Ian and I don't agree on everything. Um, it, no, it's I think, impossible. I think, it's good, I think it's a good point, and I think uh, Jeff uh, Meldrum would be the first to, to say scientifically – you know, everybody's better by disagreement, uh, and uh, and we'll leave it there. First time caller line, Rick is in Delaware on Coast to Coast AM for Glenn Kimball. Evidence, looking for evidence of Bigfoot in ancient manuscripts. Rick? How are you guys doing? First time caller. Glad to have you. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, it, is, it, is, it is true. Bigfoot exists. Uh, second point at all, they are an ancient species. They are a species protected by the government, and most important of all, this is why, and they do live underground, and this is why the government is stalling on allowing us to drill because the areas are protected for that reason. Take care. It, allowing us to not to drill where? I don't know if he hung up. I wasn't sure what he, what he meant by that because we're drilling in a lot of places. Uh, we do are have protected at, national forests. Uh, and who knows why. Okay. All right. So he means in the National Forest or Anwar or something like that. Uh, Bill is in Bloomington, Illinois, not far from my old haunts on Coast to Coast AM for Glenn Kimball. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. You know, uh, I'm somewhat skeptical because I'll tell you the reason why. The one thing that separates us from just about everything in this planet is man's curiosity to either explore or to find out what's above the horizon. Now, I'm looking at it in a, in a simplistic manner that uh, Bigfoot has offspring. We have offspring. Now, every society and every race always has a rogue. Now, either they know how to raise their children to discipline them to where, hey, don't go above surface. But I'm sure somewhere along the line, there's got to be a rogue child teenager yeah, saying, hey, exactly. I'm tired of listening to you guys. I want to go somewhere. And why hasn't we discovered or they discovered us or whatever the case may be? You know what I'm saying? Well, maybe that's uh, maybe that maybe those are the Bigfoot sightings we get, the, the rebellious ones. It's very it's very possible. And, and you know, it's an interesting thought. Uh However, there were societies for thousands of years who had well-disciplined families. Uh, we're, the, we're the society that have undisciplined families. Um, in fact, it's only been I, – I know that when I was young, my mother used to tell me, don't leave the yard, and I didn't. You know, our kids want to, but um, we put them on a leash, and they can't now, so that – uh, but they smell like Bigfoot, so maybe that's something. International Line, Elb is in Ontario, Canada, on Coast to Coast AM. Elb? Hey, good morning. Hi, you're talking with Glenn Kimball. Go ahead. Hi, Glenn. Uh, on this uh, Bigfoot, uh, I was watching uh, 
direct TV, and uh, there was a little girl down in Tennessee that she claims she talks to him. Yes, I saw that. And as far as the weapons, they took a deer decoy and showed how they grabbed him and broke her neck, and she said when they ate it made her sick, and she didn't much care for it. Well, I understand that. I think what's interesting about the weapons claim, and this is what I was tying back into Glenn's assertion that Bigfoot are um, descendants of Neanderthal, that they have gone underground and evolved and come out as as Bigfoot, is that the that it's rare to see technology go backward like that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I think there are examples of that even in our own Western culture. But to be as basic and rudimentary as you know, if Neanderthal were ca- carrying spears uh, and uh, and sharpened tools from antlers and and that sort of thing, why are Bigfoot never seen with tools? Because it would seem so basic and life providing, food providing, uh, that that would just seem like something that we would see more of. But but nobody said that they've ever seen it at all. Let's get Glenn in Harlington, Texas, for Glenn Kimball on Coast to Coast AM. Glenn, uh, Mr. Punnett. Mr. Kimball. Yes. Uh, first of all, let me uh, compliment you on that uh, extremely handsome and lyrical sounding first name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume you mean Glenn and not Ian. So go ahead, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I want to point out that uh, your analogy for survivability of a low population with the mountain gorilla isn't quite accurate. Uh Zoologists have uh, found that uh, the mountain gorilla and the lowland gorilla had a a vast range uh, after the uh, last ice age, and it's only due to the uh, encroachment of human population, and we're talking pre-Columbian human occupation, that that the numbers have shrunk and they've moved into an upland habitat. Well, I asked Jeff specifically about that. And uh, he said that there's no evidence with the population uh, ranging around 600 right now of mountain gorillas that they were uh, being uh, uh, dying off because of the weakness. Uh, oh, to- oh, I believe I believe uh, they would they would surely be almost gone if it weren't for human intervention, and may possibly still uh, go. And as for the uh, Mayans going underground, now surely you know that. We've known for 40 years that the uh, that the ruins, uh, the Mayan ruins, were just the equivalent of a Neolithic French Revolution, and they had enough with their tyrannical rulers. I mean, uh, only sensationalism uh, reflects a view that they disappeared. I mean, they're still there. They've been in open revolt with the Mexican government for 20 years. Mayan- we'll leave that. We'll leave that there. I'm sorry. That's all we have time for. Very interesting point. We'll leave it uh, to hang and. Come back for our last half hour of calls. Everybody's waiting to get through to Glenn Kimball on Coast to Coast AM. And so it is that we headed to our last half hour. Can I just say, I love the way the bumpers have maintained the theme, the big theme all night long. Just big foot, big country, big shot, bigger than myself, big. And that's really what we're talking about. Something big, if it's true, uh, if Glenn... Kimball is onto something here. It's going to be big that there are references to Bigfoot and ape-like, giant ape-like civilizations in ancient manuscripts. Read some of them earlier. Get more of your questions and comments next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. See, where do we start? I guess Rosemary's been waiting the longest west of the Rockies. She's in Chico, California for Glenn Kimball. Ancient manuscripts that mention Bigfoot underground Bigfoot. Rosemary, where are you with that? Well, uh, I lived in South, I'll say, Saudika, Sabaidi, and Najong to my Hmong friends in St. Paul. I lived seven years in Southeast Asia, so I guess I'll start with Vietnam, where I live first. Uh, the Bigfoot type they have over there, I have the actual name for it, Gigantopithecus, 10 feet tall. Uh, lives in the caves. They live in the Lang Trang Caves. And there's uh, uh, not many people have gone in there to check this out, but they, uh, there have been two American scientists went there uh, in 89, and there's hundreds of relics and bones from these uh, 
uh, these uh, primates, the Gigantopithecus. And uh, the information I have here says they coexisted with Homo erectus for 500,000 years. Now, uh, I don't know about the accuracy of that. It's a book I just picked up at the library uh, about sure. the ruins at Banqing. Uh I've been to the ruins. At, I traveled quite a bit around. I lived in Laos two years, in Thailand four years, but I traveled around Cambodia and all those places. And I've been to the Banqing rings, uh, ruins, and, I, and some of the – and they had uh, – by the way, they did have bronze as right. well as stone uh, in, in those caves. All and right, some of the things I picked up myself, I got at the. I had a friend whose father was uh, a, a Thai friend who flew in Laos, and whose father was over the ruins at Banqing. So I had a chance to get in there, and I had a number of items I got that were carbon tested, seven to nine thousand years old. All right, Glenn, you have a thought on that? Well, I I, I do. Uh, my first observation is Neanderthals uh, are probably not the only antecedent for uh, the civilization, or maybe not the only possible antecedent. And certainly, uh, cremation may have been part of the uh, the uh, the funerary uh, ceremonies for part of these civilizations. Customs change uh, when uh, over distance and and. Uh, uh, there certainly can be bones uh, left above, left in the cave, uh, but there may also be uh, a cremation kind of events that took place during the ceremonies of these individuals. But one thing is, one thing I think is important uh, to an, an observation is that if something is for real in our day, uh, it will probably find a mention in an ancient text at some point. And we certainly have demonstrated that tonight, that if that uh, the fact that uh, Bigfoot may be uh, a tongue-in-cheek subject for some people, uh, it's certainly been a, a subject that has been uh, talked about for thousands of years. Okay, and I think I think you're I think you're right on that. There have been a lot of people who have talked about other species, and we do see that. Written. The question is, are they the same other species as we talk about when we talk about Bigfoot in our forests? Mike is in Reno on Coast to Coast AM for Glenn Kimball of uh, Kimball College. You can link up to him through coasttocoastam.com. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, I hope I'm not repeating anything you might have already covered, but I started reading about giants in North America because I had – a conversation with a person who's very uh, well-educated in the Bible. He is a Jehovah's Witness, and his spin on the Nephilim was that they are uh, they were uh, actually descendants of Satan and his angels who found uh, people on earth to be fair, and the offspring were evil giants called Nephilim who were pretty much, for the most part, bullies. And I was telling this, I was talking to this with a, uh, a local Paiute Indian, a uh, young guy who uh, came from the Paiute area of Pyramid Lake, and he was living in Reno. And he said, yeah, there's a, a legend about uh, red-haired giants that pretty much terrorized the people, the Paiute Indians, and that there was a great war and that they had eventually driven them back into the east. Now, you guys earlier, someone had mentioned, where are the graves of these giants? Why isn't there hard evidence? And uh, after hearing that from him, I started researching it, and there is a story about a uh, guano expedition at Pyramid Lake, uh, and this, I think it was back in the 20s, and they found the bones of a nine-foot red-haired giant. And I found that, uh, out that a book was written about this called The Forbidden Land. And in The Forbidden Land, they talk about many burial sites across North America that had been discovered within the last 100 or 200 years. But the bones that were found in the cave at Pyramid Lake were put in a shed by one of these guano uh, uh, collectors, and he tried to contact people, and nobody would ever give him any uh, interest in it uh, about it whatsoever. And they sat there forever, and at a second point, and I believe it was in the 70s, somebody had again contacted one of the universities to say, hey, don't you want to come see these bones? Mysteriously enough, the shed caught fire and they were destroyed. But the skull was kept, and it's currently in uh, the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca, and it's a giant skull that was uh, the only piece that was not stored in the shed. 
But in the Forbidden Land, if you look, you'll hmm. see that there's many burial mounds in North America. Some were found in Minnesota, some in Ohio. Um, one in the one I think it was in Ohio had actually 20 of these uh, mummified remains of 10 foot giants. And, and just so you know, I look it up, and and they credit them to about eight foot in the um, in the version in the in the synopsis that I'm reading for yeah. the Forbidden Land. It says eight foot, but it does say that one nine foot eight inch skeleton was excavated near Brewersville, Indiana. That's correct. Uh, and uh, but it does. I haven't found the one mentioned you had Clearwater, yeah. Minnesota, which is pretty nope. near me. Skeletons of seven giants found in mounds. In mounds. In yeah, Ohio have, also. Right. And they, men, they mentioned Toledo, Ohio. The um, final thing I'll tell you about that is the interesting thing about all of these mounds that were found in North America, all of the giants had double rows of teeth and receding foreheads. Now, Glenn knows a little bit about that. Glenn? Well, obviously, you can refer to Stephen Quayle's book on giants. Uh, that's kind of old news. Uh, but uh, there were giants in the lands. The one one exception I might take is that we tend to, when something is weird and strange, we tend we tend to to uh, make it an evil uh, character uh, characterization. Right. And, and I take exception with that. Uh, I th- I feel like there were many good. Uh, you know, Magellan met one of the giant creatures in his tr- voyages. Uh, Vasco da Gama, Med One, Americo Vespucci, um, uh, a, a number of people have met uh, these giant pe- people, and and they were not aggressive uh, to 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 try and to try and blanket characterize uh, an entire culture uh, by some religious dogma is probably unfair. Uh, and certainly, certainly, it's unfair to to suggest that the the that uh, the Bible suggests that these were evil men who had fallen out of heaven and married the daughters of Eve. I I, I find that to be inconsistent because uh, those who uh, were rejected uh, uh, supposedly in the biblical scenario. And never were able to have children, and so why would they be interested in the daughters of Eve to begin with? Um, All right, wild card line. Ed is in Petaluma, California, on Coast to Coast AM for our friend Glenn Kimball. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, thank you. Glad I to talk to all of you. I just had a question. Did your manuscripts mention find any evidence in your manuscripts about you know organizations that either hunted these things down or tried to protect them? Either in the past or today, uh, I, I think uh, that that's a very good question, and the answer is no. Uh, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to say succinctly no. Uh, I think that the manuscripts rather would say that they were self uh, that they were self uh, 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 they were able to take care of themselves, uh, that they were brilliant creatures that uh, were self sustaining uh, and had powers that were beyond uh, perhaps even some of the technology we we exist that we have today. Uh, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be interesting if the scientists were open enough, open-minded enough to to be able to do to reverse engineer some of the things that we very much could find in our day and age, rather than dismissing them with the with the with a single word of skepticism from their mouth. Uh, uh, Science is famous for saying that we're fair. We treat we we treat subjects fairly, uh, when they themselves uh, treat almost nothing fairly. <laughs> there isn't a, there isn't a scientist or a historian that I know that that treats manuscripts uh, fairly. Uh, with with they 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 erase possibilities from the table with a with a with a blanket stroke. And even Jeff does. Uh, Jeff would conclude that uh, it's not possible for uh, a Bigfoot to have been anything but a but a, but an animal character, uh, an animal creature. Right. And when in fact it's it's possible. I mean, in all the realms of possibility, one of the possibilities is that they are spirit to us in some fashion. Uh, oh, go ahead. Is there more? It, well, I'm just I'm just trying to suggest that that's a possibility. 
Now, sure. whether that's true or not is remains to be seen. But but to dismiss it uh, out of hand is not scientist scientific at all. It's it's a bias, a, a clear bias that has been entered into the genre. Grego is in Omaha, Nebraska, on Coast to Coast AM for Glenn Kimball. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I was uh, first of all, uh, and thank you. This is a great show. It's uh, bringing different uh, side of Bigfoot than the normal show. You know. Good. Thank you. And uh, my question for uh, your guest here is. Uh, what what inspired you to uh, start Bigfoot, you know? Well, I really haven't started Bigfoot. The classes for last month weren't dedicated to Bigfoot. They were de- dedicated to the creation stories, to uh, Adam and Eve and to the Cave of the Treasures and to the to the creation story itself. But, but what has precipitated from it has been a discussion of Bigfoot because it mentions a, 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 an, ape, a, a, an ape culture. Uh, and whenever you deal with ancient texts, uh, you can guarantee that something will will surprise you. <laughs> it always does. A, a topic will surface. And so when you say what what inspired me, what inspired me was it appeared in the text. That's uh, all you need. It's right there. Let's get to Camille, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Oh, hi, Camille. Hello. How are you doing? Good. You got a question for Glenn Kimball? question it's kind of more like uh i honestly don't believe in bigfoot there's a perfectly good explanation for for him okay what's that um i've seen on tv shows like oprah or some some type of show like that that there are people today that have hair all over their covering their entire body face and the entire body right okay. and there's even movies about it and um and then so you have them and there's also giants in the bible like uh, goliath so you have a really big guy that uh, has hair all over his body. Why would he be Bigfoot? Why couldn't he just be a regular person like you and myself? Why would he live? If you had hair all over your body and you were just a normal person like you or me, why would you go live in the woods? Well, because back in the day, if you were different than other people, um, you know, a lot of times families would, oh, we don't know what to do with you. You're not like us. And they throw you aside. And so... So you think there are then the, the all of the, they might huh? go ahead all of the people that are living in the woods as Bigfoot are all castaways from a, from previous families or cultures okay. and now they've created a separate group <laughs> of of hairy people that are cast aside in society. Okay, I just we're to just... talking about all the people in the woods now. How many people are there in the woods that are hairy and tall? How many? I mean, does anybody know? No, these are sight things, and nobody actually knows. Nobody actually has anyone met one. They see yeah, them. Y- yes, yeah, they, and there's they have. A, there's hundreds of thousands of sightings, and so it's not an aberration. Uh, uh, it's not just one individual. It's uh, hundreds of thousands of sightings that are centered around, coincidentally, around uh, places where there are caverns, and that's maybe coincidence. Uh, but it may not be coincidence, and and the fact that it's mentioned in ancient text, uh, I find to be uh, a piece of circumstantial evidence that is curious. I mean, the the idea uh, I think Camille is that these sightings predate Western cultures moving into the United States. For example, the Native American tradition that holds that there were these creatures that were there before we ever showed up. Like the Indians. Well, not only yeah. that, but manuscript yes. evidence from from thousands of years ago mentioned this very same phenomena, and uh, I find that to be interesting. That one thing I tried to say at the top of the or at the bottom of this hour was the fact that things that are typically true appear in ancient text as well. Uh, if if you're talking about a mythology that you can sweep away with the brush of your hand, then it's probably not going to be mentioned in an ancient text anywhere. But if if, if it's mentioned in an ancient text somewhere, then it then it's it's something that is interestingly interesting enough that we should uh, investigate further. 
Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get James in St. Louis. It may be the last call we have time for, but we'll try for Sharon in just a second. Go ahead, James. Hi, hi, Ian and uh, Mr. Kimball. I got a qu- uh, well. Actually, I wanted to answer your question, Ian, about Cain and Abel. What's that? Um, Cain and Abel. They did. They both had twin sisters, and Adam and Eve were discussing among themselves how they would. Uh, multiply, and they were going to marry Cain's sister with Abel and Abel's sister with Cain. It's in, it's in the second book of uh, uh, of Adam and Eve, which is part of the Cave of Treasures. So it's in there. Right. I, I, the second book of Adam and Eve. I, I just, I've, I've never, I've never seen that. So um, if you if you go and Google apocrypha, go down to the apocrypha right. index. It has all the apocrypha on it that you can read. I have a couple of books of Apocrypha, and I don't have that one, but I'll, I'll go see if I can find that. But, um, it is in the Cave of the Treasures, and the gentleman ahead. is correct. Right. Uh, and you had a question for uh, for for Glenn? Um, I was just wondering about the Supergant, or, you know, the, the Greek uh, Bible. Sep- Septuagint. That, yes. Um, is, uh, that, is that older than the Hebrew, or is the Hebrew older than the the, the, the Greek? Septuagint. And the it, it it the Septuagint is a Greek copy of the Hebrew Bible. That's correct. Ah, I see. So it's a, it, it it exists. It, 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 it sometimes uh, all that we had was the Hebrew Bible in Greek, but now we have recovered many of the original Hebrew texts that appear to predate the Septuagint, at least in origin. West of the Rockies, Sharon is in Redding, California, on coast to coast AM. Go ahead, Sharon. Hi, I'll be real quick. Um, I have an, a question for Glenn. Is it possible that the Bigfoot are so advanced past us that they might be time travelers or they could possibly step in and out of dimensions to where they um, disappear easily on us? That's why we haven't caught any and don't have any. Well, Glenn? it's certainly a possibility, isn't it? Let's and I just it. miss no possibilities. Sounds like another future course at Kimball College. You can find out more if you link up to Glenn's website through coasttocoastam.com. You'll get information on prices and stuff, and I hope that you do. It's always fun to read up on these things. It makes conversation that much more dimensional on Coast to Coast AM. Glenn, enjoy this beautiful summer. I hope you're having a good time. We are, and the phone number for, to contact me uh, is, is on the website at kimballcollege.com. And uh, so are the uh, classes, and we hope you enjoy them. And, and I think you'll find out that if you'll take those classes one at a time, it'll substantiate what you believe, and it'll be a complete, completely fascinating uh, study. Thank you. Deus te amat, and I do too.